Welcome back to the LCS, where earlier we were looking at the mid lane matchup in TSM versus Evil Geniuses. But now I want to look at the top lane matchup, where, Mark, you were praising Impact for being this equalizing, stabilizing factor for Evil Geniuses. Yeah, I think uh, even with Impact branching out and trying to play a little bit more aggressive this split, he's been incredible uh, in that regard. And being able to bring leads from the top lane, something that was missing consistently in 2020 for EG, is a huge benefit for them. Huni was one of the people that was on EG trying to get leads in the top lane, and it was just too inconsistent, whether it was him or Kumo. Uh, and now Impact has done gone and delivered that for EG. He is officially another threat for this lineup, so it's not all on Jazuke's shoulders to try and coin flip win the game as was kind of the case in 2020. And I think that Huni actually has also provided a kind of stability for TSM these days where he has kind of transferred his play style from an only hard carry player to a weak side or at least the ability to play weak side without inting. And we've seen some before that his NAR was not always great, but it's been pretty good recently like with this champion pull and I've, I've got to say that helps a lot with draft when you are not as predictable as you used to be. So props to Huni. Just a, a little historical tidbit there. Both these top laners reached World Finals with SKT. I, I just think that's something that is not very common in a lot of games. Uh, that's not – yeah, I don't think that's common really much of anywhere, right? Uh, that you'd, uh, you'd end up going to finals from the same team in a different region and then up, uh, end up in opposing teams in a totally different one uh, playing domestically. Uh, but I love the point that you bring up there, Lorem, how, you know, in some ways uh, Huni has also, you know, found uh, a bit of stability up there in the top lane. But we saw some stark differences in those statistical numbers when it comes to the matchup in terms of CSD, a noticeable drop-off for Huni, as well as less of a forward percentage. So it seems like Impact generally able to play a more aggressive lane. Now, all that said, we do need to refocus on the mid lane because we've got two very stylistically opposite players, to say the least, manning the mid lane. You got Power of Evil again. In some people's mind, the picture of consistency. And while, yes, he will do some interesting things in the past with, say, build or champion pick, the way in which he plays it is generally something that can be relied upon. Whereas Crumbs, on the flip side, you got Jazuke. Sink or swim, it's going to be exciting regardless. It's exciting regardless, and I think a big part of this excitement comes from the contested matchup in the mid lane with Azir. Azir right now just so powerful. It's getting first pick on the side of TSM. Jazuka has played it, has had some good games on it, and so the control mages that Jazuka favors are also the ones that PoE has in mind. So I'm thinking that we might actually have a fairly contested matchup for these mid lane picks, just because teams want to have these strong control mages that will take over the team fights later in the game. I will say, uh, if uh, PoE gets the Azir, I think that the counter pick would look really different for Jazuke than vice versa. I would see a control mage versus control mage matchup for PoE. But, you know, Jazuke is willing to play the LeBlanc. He's more willing to play, say, the Lucian or these, these more aggressive counter picks. Um, so I would be curious to see where they want to go with that. Do they want to take away the Azir or if they want to try and find a lead in the actual laning phase where there has been times where PoE has been exploitable through the first 15 minutes? Good questions to ask. I got good news for you. We don't have to wait long for the answers. The teams are ready. So to get into that matchup, let's hand it back over to Flowers and Azale. Thank you very much. Let's see exactly how this one plays out. I am super excited about that mid lane matchup, especially after Power of Evil won Player of the Week last week and Jazuke died under the same turret twice. <laughs> So, oh man, you got to throw him out of the bus like that. <laughs> he put himself under that bus. I was there commentating what happened in the aftermath, but I know that Jisuke has much bus. higher highs than that, and I want to see him return to those highs. Okay, okay, I, I respect it. I respect it. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but to be fair to him, it felt like that was the first game this year where it was really like, okay, Jisuke, what are you doing? You know, and and he yeah. had had some pretty consistent performances, even going into that game. You know, the analyst S was talking about it. A lot of people were talking about, all right, it's time to get rid of the coin flip narrative. That's gone now. Jazuke is a consistent player. He's a change man. And then Jazuke, <laughs> uh, he, he had some mishaps there in that mid lane. It's fair A couple to say. mistakes. You know, so maybe he's going back to his old ways. We'll see if he can clean it up though, uh, because TSM last week looked great. And EG, yes. you know, if TSM is playing as well as they did last week, EG is going to have to really be on their game here, I think. 
Yeah, I was really impressed with how quickly TSM was able to turn things around from how rough they looked in lock-in tournament and in week number one. So we'll see if they can continue the week two success here. It's Twisted Fate, Renekton, Senna, Pantheon, Olaf, and Udyr all banned away. TSM hovering over the Rumble, the staple pick there for Huni, but instead they will switch over and first pick the Kai'Sa here for Lost. And I think a lot of TSM's success really has revolved around the fact that they now feel like they've had a more clear identity, right? It's playing towards bot lane. It's Hooney's playing survival mode. You know, often now he's, he's playing tanks. He's playing more defensive. They talked about the forward percentage being lower for him than for impact, which is not something people would really associate with these two players. They have been playing towards Sword Art and Lost, and Sword Art, instead of trying to roam with these engage picks, he's been going for things like the Pantheon and using it to just fight down in that bot lane to be able to find these engages when his team comes down to him. So it is the Kai'Sa first pick playing towards that for TSM on the other side. Incredible engage, great counter engage drafted out here from EG. The Rel, the Hecarim coming through very early on. So uh, EG already has a lot of power as far as that goes. Going towards the Azir is going to help with the disengage and the peel back. And uh, Blind Nar. So Aurelia okay. is open, but Impact's not really the guy to try to punish that. So I think while Huni has kind of gotten a lot of flack for some of his Nar games, it does feel more safe, I would say, to blind pick Nar against someone like Impact than against a lot of the other top laners in the league right now. Evil Geniuses, one more pick to go before the second part of the bans come through. They already know the enemy AD carry, but not the support. And they do decide to lock in this Samira. So it's Samira Rel, a very dangerous, very aggressive bottom lane combination here for Evil Geniuses. One thing that's actually really cool about this duo is that because you are actually tethered to the Samira, you can use Samira's dash in as a pretty much guaranteed stun. Because when you E to a target, you dash through them, and then the Rel stun is guaranteed to land. So you can almost have like a point and click stun with that, where you're getting really aggressive. If Kai'Sa steps a bit too far forward, you E to the Kai'Sa, the Rel stuns, then can follow up with the W and kind of the, the reverse of how you would normally do that combo. So there is some opportunities uh, for Deathly to perhaps get pretty aggressive here. Uh, Lilia gonna be getting banned out, so targeting uh, Spika a little bit here in the second round as well. Already the Olaf, the Udyr, you know, Pantheon even potentially jungle. Um, so three, four bands from EG targeted the way of Spika and a pretty high priority on their own Hecarim. And the Alistar banned out now by Evil Geniuses, taking one of those engaged, tanky, dive-style supports away from TSM and away from Sword Art. TSM banning out the LeBlanc, keeping Jazuke off at that when They don't want Power of Evil's Azir to have to deal with that highly mobile assassin. Pretty hard to shuffle LeBlanc without her being able to immediately just avoid or evade it afterwards, as <laughs> Shen will be the final ban here Good from point. TSM. And Evil Geniuses, what are we going to see? I need to see both solo laners out of this squad. Which one are they comfortable picking here? They already know both solo lane options for their opponents. Could be Gragas. GP, I think, would work as well if you want to play down towards bot side. If you're just going to have impact on an island, I think that's fine. You know, you have heavy engage. You can GP ult down to that bot side to set that up. So uh, this works. It does mean that they're very physical damage heavy already, so you kind of oh, know yeah. that it's going to be an AP mid laner here uh, for Jazuke. The question is going to be, is it going to be an Orianna or something like that? Uh, to speak a little bit about the bands, I really like the Shen ban here from TSM. I think Shen Hecarim is an incredible combo. Being able to just assist the Hecarim with those dives is very, very powerful. Gangplank can do that also, but it is in a different way. Nidalee the pick Ooh, here. Nidalee picks up, yeah. So we'll be interesting to see if he goes towards, you know, that Moonstaff style build, the more supportive style Nidalee, or if he wants to really uh, go more aggressive uh, for the damage here. What's that last pick going to be, TSM? We need to see Sword Art's choice into the Rel Samira combo. That dangerous point and click engage that Isaac is talking yeah. about will be answered by a Galio. So I, I wouldn't say that, that TSM have a very strong bot lane right now. As far as the 2v2 goes, I pretty heavily favor EG. Uh, the Galio is going to be useful come teamfight time, but it's it's not the easiest follow-up. You know, you don't have the point and click uh, kind of ultimate to go in on someone who's locked down, like with Camille and J4. Those are the combos that people usually really love it for. It's going to be about Huni getting in the back line, Spika hitting a spear and diving into the back line, Galio following up on that. Uh, I think for TSM, they're going to play this, this 2v2 relatively defensive. You have to be careful about the power of Samira and Rel. If there's any sort of all-in, I do think it would go the way of EG. Um, but I really actually like their draft quite a bit. 
you know, you have the rise here for Jazuke. That gives you the AP that you do need. It gives you a side laner that can go out and actually 1-3-1 one, one alongside the GP. I think that they can potentially have, you know, pretty strong advantages in those side lanes later on. They will have to be careful about any potential assistance from someone like the Galio, but, you know, Rise can be pretty frightening uh, for Anar to, to lane against later on in the game and it may be able to, to both 5v5 and split push. Plus, Rise is one of Jazuke's comfort picks, right? We've seen this guy play this champion tons of times before, so if you want Jazuke to be able to pop off and be in a good state to play to his maximum capability, put him on a champion that he knows. And taking this Rise up into the Azir, we'll see which one of these two hyper-scaling AP mid laners can carry harder. It's going to be really interesting. He's also been great at the realms. You know, when he has actually brought this out, mm -hmm. he's been very effective at, at utilizing the realm warp very often, and even sometimes earlier than people do expect to get out to these side lanes. We saw him pull off a lot of plays up towards the top lane, you know, grouping up with Svenskeren, going to attack the lane uh, where Impact was. But they could also do this down towards the bot side also. So uh, I'm going to be really interested to see how he does perform on it. Uh, Rise is not a pick that is, is super popular right now. You know, it, right. it is a pick that scales very well, but it is in the dumps as far as solo queue. It's not really played much at all in pro uh, besides, you know, a, a few games here or there. So this is very much a Jazuke flavor pick. And, and I think it's exciting to see someone have those and to perform well on them. Plus, it can catch people off guard, right? If you're not used to playing against it, if you're only scrimming against the Azirs, the Orianas, and the Syndras, it's much easier for somebody on one of those less picked champions to surprise you in what could be a game-changing moment if Jazuke is able to pop off, have a huge Realm Warp. We know that Ryze is not only one of those champions that can dish out tons of damage in fights in particular, but proper usage of that Realm Warp with some minions, with some other champions, can really create some game-changing plays. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point. You know, the Realm Warp isn't just about those potential roams. You know, you can do something like sending the Rel in with a Realm Warp, right? You know, Realm Warp the Rel in on top uh, of, the, of the back line for a team fight. Then all of a sudden, the Rel is basically flanking while the Hecarim's coming in from one side and your GP ulted. And that's a pretty frightening situation for someone like the Azir or even the Kai'Sa. All right, we're on to the Rift. Let's see how this one shakes out. Looking at everything across the board here, it's Grasp of the Undying versus Grasp of the Undying up there in top side. Not too surprised about that. He got Nidalee with the Conqueror versus the Phase Rush on Svenskeren's Hecarim. Power of Evil running the Comet on Azir, unlike the Azir that we saw before running Lethal Tempo against a melee opponent up against a ranged enemy. Comet's going to give him a much better laning phase. And then everything down there in bottom lane is par for the course. Exactly. I think it's, it's really just about these short trades. You know, when uh, you're up against someone like Ryze, you want to utilize your range. Just continually poke away with those cues from the Azir. You know, land that Comet. Try to push Jizuke out of lane. Uh, Azir also ha has an advantage as far as the mana war goes. You know, generally speaking, Ryze is very mana hungry uh, because, you know, the, the Sand Soldiers don't really cost you too much. You can actually sometimes just get control of the wave in a matchup like this and constantly push in the rise, force him to use out a lot of mana. And if you can get the push, then it's, it's really going to work heavily in your favor because you're going to force rise back to base at pretty odd timing. So Jizuke is trying to combat this by getting control of the wave through actually just fighting Power of Evil. You could see him posturing aggressively, you know, landing multiple E's on Power of Evil and really trying to go right at him. Jizuke just trying to make sure he doesn't get stuck in that bad spot you're talking about. A couple of these minions down very low on HP. Jizuke will farm up that first one. That remaining caster minion's pretty low, but man, Power of Evil just has these soldiers ready to go. Every time Jizuke so steps up, it's Power of Evil there ready to punish him for it, and Jizuke's already down below half HP. Paying attention to the bottom lane. Remember, this could turn aggro at any given moment. We have seen Samira lanes go in at level one plenty of times before if given the opportunity. But with Sword Art and Lost having the level two power spike first, it means they're the ones that are making the offensive oh. plays. Ignar down to 100 HP. And that is just a big mistake from EG, but we're going to see a gank mid lane here. Ghost popped. It's been scaring coming in there. Brings Power of Evil right back to Jazuke with a little bit more damage coming through. There it is, the first blood for Spin Scaring. Nicely done by EG here in the mid lane. A great trade from TSM's 2v2 down in bot lane, but Sven Skarin able to get in behind him just barely to scoop him back into that Rise stun. Power of Evil did flash very early, um, but he is just level two, so he doesn't actually have the dash. He can't escape with that. That is why the timing on this gank was so key. Sven Skarin with the early ghost there to get behind his opponent, scoop him back in, 
and grab themselves that first blood. It's too bad for them that it didn't go to the rise because Shizuke right. <laughs> had to go back to base with like seven CS. But <laughs> yeah, it feels a, pretty bad. A, a win is a win. Yeah, kills a kill. Don't worry about it. Spin Scarin throwing out the Scryer's Bloom there to try to come down and contest for this crab, but the Bloom just barely misses seeing Spika, so he face checks instead, loses half his HP, and Nidalee will take that Scuttle Crab there for free, considering Power of Evil was right next to him. So Spika will pick up a little bit of extra money there. Spin Scarin on this Hecarim. We'll see if he can continue chaining some ganks into some success. Right now, it's his top laner that has Pryo over that lane as Ignar comes back down into the river here in bottom side. Noticing both of their opponents walking through here. Ignar does not want to go in and engage on this. Definitely still just farming up the wave, and Ignar remains in the brush. Sword Art and Lost, despite having one out in that level two fight, are now once again on even ground with their opponents. Yep, on even ground there. They actually did take away the Scuttle, so it's not Spika grabbing both Scuttles, but it is TSM getting both Scuttles. You know, when they saw that Nidalee did push out Hecarim up on the top side, they had the shove in that bot lane 2v2 because of that earlier one trade. They had forced out the potions from Ignar. So that allowed them to just move up and take the scuttle for themselves. A nice little gold injection there for a lost. And denying that from Sven Skarin is going to be feeling really, really good here. So we'll have to track how this mid lane does continue to go. You know, Power of Evil uh, did TP back, but he had no buy whatsoever. A little bit surprised about that. Rise, at least with the assist, yeah. did get a tier. So uh, he's low it's on something. mana, but he's just going to push really, really heavily. And when you get the wave in like this, you can just go for a quick reset if you want to. Or he'll move around the side here, try huh. to get some vision down in the enemy jungle, perhaps. Takes the blast cone, goes Let's over the wall. Off. There's nothing here. Could see a dive in top lane. Huni has no rage, and he's at 400 HP. Jizuke coming around from the side. They're going to need the rise to tank the turret aggro here at the start. Going in, and there's the instant kill. Jizuke gets in, gets out, and gets paid. That is such a ballsy roam. You love to see Jizuke able to pull this off. Instead of just taking the reset, he's going up at like 10% mana. <laughs> to dive <top laughs> yep. lane. You know, it's screw mid lane. Who needs to be here? He's just going to show up top lane and dive Huni. They get out the TP and the flash. Svenskeren's got to be careful, though. They are down a member here, so you don't want to be messing around with this too much unless Impact's going to oh. or something. Svenskeren, what is this, man? You're about to be killed off if you ain't any more careful than that. Sword Art down to 300 HP now as well. The heal from Deftly was imperative in keeping the jungler alive. Ignar down to nothing and lost with the flash to go in and make sure they finish him off. Evil geniuses lose one in the bottom side, and TSM is on the board. That is just straight up hubris from Svenskeren. They knew that there, there wasn't going to be as, as many members there, potentially. You know, they knew that Jizuke was up to that top side, and, and that is just kind of not your jungle. Definitely wasn't actually with them initially. He was back over on that wave. So when you were pushing in, you have to remember, it's Hecarim versus Nidalee. Nidalee is one of the strongest early dueling junglers in the game here, and Hecarim is Hecarim. Hecarim is Hecarim. You want to get to six. <laughs> you don't want to fight like that. Well, let's take another look at how it happens. Finscaren just checks yeah. the brush, and boy, does he wish he didn't. Yep, and just walking a little bit too far forward. I, I do believe they knew that the bot lane was around, but clearly he didn't know that they were in that brush. Ignar with a nice peel to keep his jungler alive, but it does end up costing him his life. At the very least, they did get some summoners out from their opponents as well, so Lost did use his flash to, to finish off that kill. Um, things going pretty well for EG up on the top side, so gold is dead even. Has been a, a very hotly contested game. You love to see both teams trying to make these moves here early on. As Sword Art and Lost will have a large wave to pick up here in the bottom side. Drake's still alive on the map. Neither one of the teams going after an early take on that one. Jizuke once again on the roam here with the rise. You can see that the Realm Warp was on cooldown. He just tried to use that. It didn't end up turning into much of a play there for them. Huni just pops the Blast Cone, making sure that it's not a viable <laughs> escape route if they try to dive him again. He knows this can only be used for sinister things, Azale. Yeah, he does, man. He is, he's not liking it one bit. He's playing weak side. He knows it. So they're going to be trying to be defensive up there on that top lane. Uh, I am interested to see that it is actually a verdant barrier rush here from Power of Evil. You know, people are all about these stacking defensive items in mid lane now. You get so much bonus MR, you know, not only just from the, the flat MR on it, but actually from every minion you kill thereafter is giving you bonus MR uh, all the way up to something like 40 or, or so, I believe, when it is fully stacked. 
Uh, and people are all about it, but it is a physical damage top lane, a physical damage jungler. It's, you know, a pure physical damage AD carry. So I'm a little bit surprised to see him taking this defensive of a route against Jizuke, who is really the only one dealing magic damage this game. You know, if anything, I would have expected Jizuke to maybe go for that, you know, up against Azira and Nidalee, but uh, it's just not the kind of player Jizuke is. He wants damage. Well, Jazuke is pushing forward now. Sword Art coming in from the side, but considering both rosters decided to rotate multiple players into the mid lane, neither one wants to Light. be the one to go in here first. But Rift Herald has been started up by TSM. Huni's keeping the aggro on that one. Another hit onto the eyeball takes it down very low. Smite comes through when the eyeball is secured. TSM have Shelly, and they should be able to disengage this one. Jazuke still pushing forward, seeing if there's a play to be made, a catch to be found. Definitely finds a little bit of damage onto Power of Evil, but he gets away. This is one of those cases where I just would have much preferred EG just stay bot lane and just farm up that wave, you know, get the solo gold, maybe take down a plate or something like that if you can do that as deftly. I just don't think, especially when you are late to the play, that it's worth making the rotation. You know, I understand why they did it, because they felt like they were in a, in a winning position as far as the 5v5 goes. And that being said, the wave was slow pushing towards them, so they were denying experience, so that makes it, I think, a, a lot better than, than it would have otherwise been, uh, because... Lost is still going to be missing out on, on all these waves that have died to his minions. But right. still, I just think this is something that we've talked about for, for a couple of years where teams sometimes are over committing to going towards that first Herald, right? You know, it's, it's worth 320 gold. If you're sending five members out there and you're losing waves and you're foregoing turret plates to try to get something that is going to get you two turret plates, it just doesn't really make sense. Definitely slowly clearing out all these minions, farming up now to an even state with Lost. Spika's down here recognizing that his lane still maintains the priority because of that push so he can pick up the Scuttle Crab. And now nine minutes, almost 10 minutes into the game, we are seeing that Drake finally started up by the side of TSM. Now Sven Scarvin is nearby, but it is a single Cloud Drake so I don't know how much Evil Geniuses want to commit to this, or TSM for that matter, as it looks like TSM's going to fully back away from the Drake, and it's Evil Geniuses now taking over here in the pit. I mean, EG definitely want to fight, right? They showed us that by moving all of their members up towards that Rift Herald, trying to get some sort of an engage. But now in this case, TSM is actually pushing in bot. So even if they don't come towards this, uh, they are at least going to deny some minions down here in this bot lane. And it will just be a dragon here for EG. They can back off. Going to be feeling pretty good, I think, about that early cloud. Uh, as they do have some pretty long ultimate cooldowns that it's always going to feel nice to be getting that CDR on for Gangplank, for Hecarim, uh, even for Rise if you want to be proactive with that. And you're right. going to get a lot of use out of that cloud. And man, using this as sort of a checkpoint to notice the state of the game, dead even in terms of gold. 16.7 versus 16.7 as those last couple of minions are picked up right there. The Drake being really the only thing separating the two squads here as farming and just general resource allocation have broken even for both sides. You can see one plate was taken off of the mid lane tier one of Jazuke there. Power of Evil managing to collect that one. But then back on TSM's oh. side, if Power of Evil's emblem would move a little bit out of the way, we'd be able to see how many plates are left on that. And it's four there too. So lots of even trading across the board with Jazuke once again paying a visit up to the poor little space Yordle here in the top Earth lane. The way, though. Lands the root, lands the damage. Finscaren coming in to finish him off. Impact takes the kill. Sword Art has arrived with a heroic entrance, but it is not heroic enough, my friends. Evil geniuses get the kill and they're getting away. Power of Evil may be able to swoop in here, try to find some sort of a secondary kill, but no, the range isn't quite there. Yeah, really nicely done from EG. TSM had a pretty good read on the play, but just a second or two too late. You know, Spika, I thought he had seen Jizuke, but clearly he hadn't. He was over on the Gromp when that dive was starting out, and then Honey just couldn't actually get to Mega, couldn't survive long enough to turn that around, and Jizuke could be in some trouble. Jizuke with the flash out to make sure he stays alive from that. TSM pursuing that play for an extra little bit of time does earn them an extra summoner spell, and Ryze is now especially vulnerable with no escape mechanisms ready. You know, I will say, I, I think that Power of Evil probably could have just flashed and ulted him back in. I mean, you're already committing the teleport from Gnar and everything. Uh, I think he might have been in range to actually flash follow and just scoop in Jizuke with his ultimate, but maybe not feeling confident about being able to pull off that play or it being even worthwhile. So they don't end up going for it. And the game, as you say, is incredibly even. And even despite the fact that EG have the dragon advantage, TSM got Harold. And Power of Evil's going in for Jizuke, looking to grab the kill here with a flash forward in the Q auto, and Power of Evil gets a solo kill on Jizuke as his teammates grab the first turret in the bottom lane with Shelly, and TSM is popping off in two lanes at the same time. I see what it was. He didn't want to share the kill 
with the rest ah, of the Ah, the big teammates. brain play. Yeah, I mean, if you flash forward and scoop him in, in the jungle, maybe one of your dirty teammates is going to steal that <laughs> away from you, you know? This way, he guarantees it. No one around. It's isolated. Power of Evil sees his opportunity, swoops on in, knocks in Jizuke with the ultimate. Knowing he didn't have the flash, he felt confident to follow there. And you can see how, how defensive Huni is playing. He's already been dove twice oh, on man. this. He has no vision in his side of the jungle. So he has no idea. Is Hecarim already here at the Tri Brush? And that's why Huni is playing so far back. Uh, I think Huni is playing okay as far as, as far as the weak side is concerned. He's not really getting a lot of help. But it has to be said that you're not going to be feeling too good about the fact that he is losing almost his third plate now. You know, the Gangplank is very far ahead in the farm, has the additional kills, has the free goal that is getting injected into him. And now as Huni finally steps up, here comes three members of EG. Well, Sword Art at least knows that something is going on here, and he's coming up to try to protect his teammate as Finscaren moves around to maybe grab a kill onto the support instead. Lands the onslaught of shadows as Ignar approaches from the side, goes in for the Magnet Storm to try to keep Sword Art locked down, but Huni's grabbing the kill on Jazuke. It's a double kill over to Huni. It's TSM turning this sucker right back around with Power of Evil picking up Ignar. Make that one a three for zero. Nicely done. This time, TSM is there for the play. They were there early, and they were ready to scrap here. Huni getting multiple kills there is so big as well, because him falling too far behind would mean TSM would have no control in the side lane whatsoever. You know, he is the guy who's going to have to be matching up against Suzuki or matching up against Impact. And Spika is going for a very oddball build here. You know, I would love to tell you exactly his reasoning on, on the Divine Thunderer, but I just can't. Uh, I've never seen it. And even looking at solo queue data, you know, comparing over the last 14 days, this was bought 160 times on Nidalee compared to 124,000 times <laughs> Night what? Harvester was purchased. Okay, so... Okay, so it's no one one-thousandth one as popular as Night Harvester. Yeah, and, and I mean... Okay. My, my, thought, my thought here... Uh, is that it's probably more about the skirmishing. He has it with the Conqueror. It almost feels like a Frozen Fist in Italy. Uh, but we can go back into this Sword Art, proccing the Aftershock early here, able to kite back, and Huni coming in, had the Mega Charge. Uh, the GP ulti was there, but not getting much value as all of TSM collapsed. And really, it felt like EG just committed too much to trying to take down Sword Art. And Sword Art having the Exhaust, proccing the Aftershock early, being able to flash out, meant he was going to survive. And now they have that second Herald for themselves, and that's probably mid lane turret, even without it. They could even drop it for the tier two if they wanted to try to take another tower. DSM doing really well in these last couple minutes, and I'm going to be interested to see how this build for Spiga does scale into late game. My assumption would be it would be very bad as far as the scaling, because it really okay. does feel much more like, uh, you know, 1v1 style auto attack heavy. You have the AD in there, you know, scrap it up against someone like Sven Skarin and try to just dominate a 1v1. And I think, you know, it, it would accomplish that. Uh, but I think it's going to be pretty difficult uh, to be getting enough attacks out, you know, enough autos out to really make this pay off big time later on. So despite the fact that TSM is pulling pretty far ahead in gold, I do think the Nidalee could potentially be a very big liability for your team fight. We'll see how he continues to evolve this build moving forward, as with the Seeker's Arm Guard and Inventory, it looks like he will be going over towards more traditional AP-style itemization with a Zonia's Hourglass, so he can jump into the fight and drop the aggro. On the other side of things, Svinscaren with the Stride Breaker. This item has been getting a lot more popular after the nerfs to Gore Drinker. It still has a powerful AoE active, slows people down, and the mythic bonus of 3% exactly. movement speed, very, very nice for Hecarim, as Jizuke will continue pushing up here in the side lane, but after Huni got paid with that double kill during that last botched attempt on him, he is comfortable in this 1v1 side matchup once again. I mean, you're, you're a longtime league player, so you remember back when there was, you know, the quints and everything. And oh, yeah, move speed quints. Loved move speed quints, right? So that's basically what this is here for him, being able to get that passive. Uh, does give you a lot of additional move speed, get around the map, and obviously, as we know, the E does more damage the faster you are going, so that is pretty powerful. TSM. Four members moving up here, and Power of Evil is kind of playing bodyguard. Oh, nice engage on to loss. Finscaring going in, looking to finish off the kill. Onslaught of shadows over the wall with the CC down onto the enemy AD carry and definitely takes him out. Evil geniuses go in. They throw everything in the kitchen sink at him, and it is enough to get the one kill. TSM lose their AD and back away from the play. 
Nicely done by EG. They are able to pick up that kill. They are able to defend the tower, but they sent five members up towards that. They even used the TP there from Jizuke, so no one is answering Huni right now. You know, mid lane going to get pushed up here for Power of Evil. So it is just the one kill for EG, not the end of the world uh, for TSM, as they're going to be able to even take away some additional jungle camps. So even just gold-wise, it's probably going to be about even or even negative if Huni can finish this off. Huni getting caught out a little bit here. Svenskeren coming around from the side, but a very nice Meganar ulti into the wall to stop him. And there it is, Divine Sunderer burst with the enchanted auto attack from the Cougar form Q as Impact tries to get himself away, but the damage coming out of PoE shuffles him away just a little bit too soon, and he will stay alive. Evil Genius is still sticking around down here with multiple TSM players in their blue side jungle. Buff ends up going over to Power of Evil exactly where TSM wanted it. Yeah, Sword Art, though. Grab that and it looks like they want to chase here, but this would be risky. Even, even with Sword Art getting low, if you dash in on him, even just a quick taunt would be enough to lock you up for a Nidalee Spear uh, for Power of Evil to turn around on you, so you can't really go for that play. I love how Sword Art is flashing the Misfits Worlds icon, because that can both be a hell yeah, we've got Power of Evil, or hey, Ignar, remember how you guys almost beat SKT. <laughs> You can either use it to cheer on your own teammate or BM the other guy at the same it, time. Why can't it be door number door number three, where you're just BMing both your teammate and the enemy team? <laughs> <laughs> you want to BM your own guy? I mean, you played with me. I love to. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess that's true. I forgot who I was talking to. Self-blame right. is the best blame, Captain Flowers. We just keeps everybody humble. Teammates. That's the point. Keeping them humble. All right. Yeah. TSM still commanding a 4,000 gold lead here in this game. Jazuke is going to take care of a little bit of that here in the bottom side, taking that tier one turret out. Still a four to two turret comparison here with TSM having twice as many of those as their opponents do. But the Drakes are tied up this game. We're still 15 seconds away before Baron is allowed to spawn. Nobody's got any vision up around there just yet. Nobody's worried. But the next Drake spawns in over a minute here, just a little bit over that. So we'll probably see the teams go towards that and look to contest as TSM approaches the top side river in the Scuttle Crab. Mm -hmm. Going to be moving up towards that top side. Uh, we'll see if they want to be able to, to actually threaten this Baron. They do have Kaisa, which takes it very quick alongside Azir. You know, these are two of the, the best champions at actually burning down that Baron. So EG really do need to keep eyes on this. It is a legitimate threat at any point in the game. Once the Baron is up there, if you lose vision of multiple members here from TSM, they could be doing Baron um, pretty comfortably. So EG is going to have to push out mid here, and then they're going to use this to move up into the river and likely clear out some of the wards around that Baron. All right, Evil Genius is roaming as a squad, looking to be ready here, but it's a TP coming in from TSM, looking for Double the flank. TP. Power of Evil and Huni both teleporting in. Ignar jumping away, trying to stay alive. TSM will not get any kills thus far, but definitely is down below half HP as Evil Geniuses rotate over. They meet up with Jizuke. Everybody's grouped up and ready to go now, but Defley's health is a serious concern if this turns into a full-on fight. He'll try to vamp up off of the Gromp as well as he can. A couple more auto attacks into that one. Okay, back to 75%. He's in much better shape now. Drake has spawned. Spika throws out the spear, instantly causes it to aggro onto the Evil Genius's lineup. Jizuke is on the back side of the pit. Looking to get involved if he can. Power of Evil eating the damage from a single barrel. Good shot there from Impact. Mega. TSM still looking to maybe compare this one. Maybe try to go in for the 50-50. It's the Kaisa of all people who ends up taking the kill. As Huni goes Mega, Ignar goes in. Follow up coming out from Evil Geniuses with the AOE damage coming down. Power of Evil taking the kill on the enemy jungler here right at the very start. Making it a one for one, one for two. TSM's coming in with a double kill for the Emperor. Oh, baby, it's TSM. A quadra kill for Power of Evil. The AOE for TSM. EG go for the engage, but they're not able to finish off any of the critical carries here for TSM, and they absolutely get destroyed in that fight. Definitely could not even get access to a lot of these members as we watch the replay on the Bud Light Ace here. In goes Ignar. He finds the angle as they're exiting out, catching three members there, but Loss was not touched, Power of Evil was not touched, and then look at Power of Evil scooting back into the rest of his team, drops his Azir ultimate, and definitely can't really cross through. He's pretty long into the fight, but still did not have his passive fully charged up there to even drop a single ultimate during that. And with that, it may be the straw that has broken the camel's back. TSM grabbed Baron, they got the dragon, they're up nearly 7,000 gold at this point. And with the Azir, with the Kai'Sa as that late game insurance, it feels like they have everything they need now. 
Man, this is scary now for Evil Geniuses. The start of that fight looked so good, but the end of that fight looks so bad. <laughs> Six and one on this mid lane Azir. The guy who got player of the week last week and only had deaths in one out of three of their matches is now 6-1-1 one, and one with a 40 CS advantage over his lane opponent here in the first game of week number three. TSM is turning things on right when they need to, and they're going for the tier three turret here in the mid lane. Evil geniuses rotate over in time to stop them, but TSM have no interest in contesting this for a fight because their big carry power of evil is up there in that top lane, just maintaining the split push here in the 4-1 with the Baron setup. Now the rest of the squad can bounce back and forth between whichever lane currently has minions and pressure, and TSM will look to break this inhibitor line. A couple of auto attacks into that tier three turret, bringing it down to almost half HP. There it goes, just about finished off, and there it is. TSM into the enemy base now, inhibitor under fire. Sven Scarin looking for an angle, an opportunity to go in. Huni has taken the mid lane tier three in the meantime, and evil geniuses are just being pulled back and forth and back and forth, and they cannot find any solid ground to stand on. That was a wacky NAR ultimate. Not quite sure what the point of that was, but hey, they're still winning out. Everything's still going TSM's way, and evil geniuses are stuck on the back foot. And just uh, give Sven Scarin a little scoop, say, get back to your base. Don't come out here. <laughs> Stay in there. You can't cross this line. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's asserting dominance. You can have your base for now, but nothing more. But Shizuke at least completed his second item. But you look over at Power of Evil, he's already got three. Uh, it would have to be an incredible performance from EG to be able to win a team fight from here. But TSM playing it slow, just kind of bleeding him out, chipping away at this mid lane and hip here. And Huni now almost has his ultimate ready to go. He's got the Meganar pretty much up, and now TSM, second inhibitor down. They can reset, spend this gold, take away the jungle on the way out, and they are just going to be so far ahead that at that point, it's really simple to just walk four members down bot lane, have Huni escorting in waves top and mid, and wait for those supers to get to the Nexus Towers, and from there, it's pretty much indefensible because EG have to send someone back to answer that, and at that point, you lose that third inhib. This was a very good use of Baron for TSM, taking down two different inhibitors after having neither one of the inhibitor turrets cracked beforehand means a very good usage of that big buff. Next, Drake spawning here in one minute. You would expect TSM to have full control over the entirety of the map. Evil geniuses are almost confined to their base now. Remember, if they lose that last remaining inhibitor, that will mean double super minions in every lane for the next few minutes, and they will have no way to leave at all mm -hmm. and everyone except Huni is, is like an item ahead right so it's it's just the the fights are so hard to imagine uh losing those fights for tsm you know, when you're a full item ahead as far as your completions for mid lane and for bot lane you know even the jungler has the second item completed whereas when scaren still does not so it's gonna be incredibly hard they have Jizuke out in that top lane, but Huni just has to escort in the wave, and if Jizuke doesn't return right now, he's got no TP, so they could even just engage on them and fight them right now, 5v4. Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. TSM going in, looking to make the plays right now as you got Spin scaring into the back line. Going to be kept alive here with the Spirit of Dread. Speak of grabbing the kill onto Ignar as TSM lose their mid laner. Deathly's the target. Lost is going in. Deathly spinning around in a circle. Stopwatch keeping Lost alive. Deathly still surviving here with about one third HP, but it is a two for one in the favor of TSM. They will take the fight, they will take the inhibitor, and they're looking to take the Nexus turret. Spika goes in, and Divine Sunders Jazuke out of Summoner's Rift. Impacts now your target with TSM picking up another one. It's definitely against the world. It might be pre-nerf Samira, but I don't think even that champion's able to outplay this one in a 1v4. He'll look for the chance to go in. He's got the style meter ready to go, but the CC is applied and definitely died. Now TSM is marching straight for the end of the game. The Nexus will be the target. Sven Skaren's coming out trying to make some sort of a last stand. He shuts down the enemy AD carry, but with only Ignar remaining, we call it GG. TSM take down Evil Geniuses 27 minutes in. TSM continue those winning ways here. Another win for them after that 3-0 weekend last week, and they are looking really happy about it. Taking down EG looking very good in the process. It was a lot of pressure up towards that top lane that Huni had to withstand. It felt like EG had a way in through that top lane, but TSM 
able to have members up there to answer. And that one fight over in TSM's blue jungle really did feel like it swung things. You know, Huni went from being down 20 CS, you know, no kills, impact way ahead, bullying him to picking up multiple kills there. And that felt like it really stopped the bleeding. And then that massive team fight around the dragon, Power of Evil, just crushing through people. And you think Ignar just narrowly could not connect with Loss, could not connect with Power of Evil. TSM really did execute well in the team fights. And it's it's pretty cool to see them improving week over week like this. You know, EG, I think overall. Uh, looked pretty good in the in the early minutes of this game, but it didn't feel like we, we really got to see much of anything from Samira. And this is one of those champions that has always, to me, felt very feast or famine. And this was really one of those famine games where you're outranged by the Azir. We never saw definitely really able to get an effective ultimate and just it just didn't really do much in, in any of these team fights. Well, TSM fans have got to be happy with the fact that this team is continuing what we saw from them in week number two. It's time for us to head to a break here again. But after that break is over, we will have head coach Bjergsen himself here for the Verizon post-game interview. So y'all don't want to miss that. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the LCS, everyone. I am so excited to have TSM head coach Bjergsen here for our Verizon post-game interview. Man, we have you on the broadcast. First things, talk to me about your transition going from playing the game on the daily to now as a coach, probably struggling to find some time to play the game yourself. Uh, it's been really fun, but also pretty challenging. Um, I think that I'm definitely learning, as you can tell in the beginning. Some of the drafts were pretty rough, especially in the lock-in tournament. But I think that we really found a groove and figured out a little bit more how we want to play and draft as a team. And 
uh, as you can see during the game, we're just a lot more on the same page. So that also makes my job a lot easier. Yep. Big changes we are seeing in the results too for TSM in these recent performances. A 4-0 now after these games. After working with the team, what do you feel is the biggest difference maker and area of improvement that has allowed TSM to turn over this new clean leaf? Mm, I think there's just a lot of things that we were working on, but in week one, they didn't really get to show up. But that didn't mean that we weren't actually working on those things. And then going into week two, we made a few changes and then it seemed like a lot of things that we had been working on, we simplified some of them. We really sat down and talked about how this team of five players are going to win the easiest. What is the strength of each player? What is the kind of natural play style of each player in our team? And uh, I think just with all those things, all those conversations, we kind of had a little bit of a click and, and that's where we are now. We're still far from the, you know, being a really powerful team that's going to, to come in and sweep the final or anything like that. So we still have a lot of things to work on, but we have a, solid foundation now that we can build off of. Yeah, I know in the uh, TSM press conference that you did recently, you were talking about some of those things that you are working on as a coach with the team. And Power of Evil in his Player of the Week interview was talking about how you're both learning from each other, adding those spheres of knowledge that you've both developed over time. What has that been like as far as looking at some of those benefits that you have this history with these players and are changing so swiftly from being on the rift to yourself as a top mid laner to now in that coach position? How's that working in your favor? Mm, I mean, I've only really, I've only played with Spica before out of all these players. So I think most of them, they don't really know how I am as a player or really get to know me that much of a per, as a person. So I hope that they have a pretty fresh experience of working with me as a coach. Um, I think for, for Tristan, it's been really enjoyable working with him. He's a much better mage player than, than I ever was. And you can see every time he gets his ear, we just win. So maybe teams should actually start banning that. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of benefit to being a professional player because you understand the game kind of you're able to visualize how things should actually play out within a game and what things actually work in the game because you have played the game at a high level. I think that's very different and the players can relate to me on that level having played the game uh, at a professional level. It's also interesting because you're mentioning how it is working with Power of Evil in this context. And there is a change from you from being a player to a coach. Parth had mentioned some of the fact that TSM as an organization with the history, there's a lot of pressure there with the titles. You know that as a player, and you mentioned some of the criticism to TSM on drafting before. How are you dealing with that transition into that coach's position and kind of handling all of that pressure in a very different capacity? Mm. I mean, handling the pressure as a coach is a lot easier, honestly, because my performance is really just a draft phase, whereas the players have to perform throughout the entire game, right? So I think it's mostly for the players themselves. Uh, I don't know how much they're really affected by the pressure, but I know that being on TSM, there is generally a lot more pressure from the fans and from social media for you to do well compared to some other teams in North America. So uh, I've talked to them about some of that and, and some of how I handle it. But I think every person kind of handles it differently. And I also encourage them to figure out what is their best relationship with uh, the community, with social media, and, and a healthy way for them to interact with it. Having touched base with your team, you do have 100 Thieves next. Obviously, you haven't had time to digest today's game just yet. But how are you all feeling going into that compared to when you first faced off against them at the start of lock-in? <laughs> Uh, that game was pretty tragic, I'm not going to lie. Uh, we really just got blown out last time, but I think we are a very different team now. I do think that we made some early game mistakes today against EG, and if we make those same mistakes against 100 Thieves, it's not going to be as easy to come back. So uh, I really want to see us coming stronger out in the early game, and if we do and we can test them in the early game, I think we're just a better team come kind of mid-game, late-game, and, and team fighting. Well, we're all looking forward to it, Bjergsen. Thanks for stopping by and talking and sipping some tea here on the broadcast. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone, we do still have more action to come. So let's send things over to the State Farm Analyst Desk.
Thank you very much, the Tigers. It's going to take some getting used to seeing Bjergsen uh, interviewed in a coaching position as opposed to a player position. Uh, and just generally, I think this raises to me an interesting point around uh, the transition of a lot of our now retired players into other roles within different organizations. And I'll be curious uh, what an interview with Bjergsen will look like at the end of this year as he cited kind of how green, how new he is to the coaching position. And now he's really just trying to find his footing. I Either way, though, the turnaround continues here for TSM uh, in what was a, a beautiful trending up week last week, continued into today and a and up against rather opponents in Evil Geniuses. Uh, uh, Mark, I mean, I think it's no surprise to anybody that it was still EG that threw the first punch in this mm. game. But at the end of the day, it was TSM who took it to the end. Yeah, they threw the first punch. They threw the first couple punches, really. And I was overall impressed with what EG's game plan was. I really liked it. They aggressively attacked mid lane early on, flashing on top of PoE to get this first kill. And, uh, you know, just get some gold into the pockets of Ry so he can start getting on the map and influencing the side lanes. And that's exactly what they did. Pre-6 even, this was a hard roam, not using his ult to just clap uh, Huni really quickly and get a couple kills. Um, I do have to give a quick head tap to TSM as well on the opposite side, going for an invade and, and still trying to make things happen so they're not just sitting back. This is the kind of improvement that we were happy to see out of uh, TSM last week, uh, that they were more proactive and they were able to pick up their own kill. But overall, the early game looked pretty clean out of EG. They had a game plan and they executed it time and time again. Yeah, and I think that TSM also executed their game plan as well. You played around the bottom side. You allowed PoE to catch up in the mid lane, and then when you had enough resources in the bottom lane, you defended Huni in the top side from the dive. So despite Huni dying, it felt like TSM was playing their game plan the whole way through and getting PoE Azir was the one thing that yeah. really surprised me. I mean, Bjergsen said it even just last week when they started the first pick, it really felt like this was the first piece of the TSM compositions finally finding their stride. Yeah, how about that? Calling his shots there, even suggesting to other teams, ban this pick out in the future. Alorum, that's quite a turnaround for a team that, again, just a week ago was receiving quite a lot of flame for the uh, for the overall success of their drafting phase. Yeah, they, they've received a lot of flame for the draft, and not, not only that, but they've kind of been a little inconsistent in the past. But for mid lane, we've seen that power of import, uh, power of evil, I'm sorry. That, <laughs> power of imports, baby. <laughs> that he's DOI. been consistent pretty much the entire time. Even when TSM was having bad games, he was consistently like being a rock in the mid lane, and most of the time when they were losing, he was not doing very poorly at all, along with Spika, and most of the problems were coming around the bot side or the top side. So as we keep seeing TSM scale, then it's just going to be an upward trend from here on because PoE can't really do worse. Be, as we've seen, he's just been so consistent, even on worse teams that he was on before. When he was on Optic, you know, even with yours truly, we weren't exactly doing well, but PoE was always doing well. So as long as TSM continues just this realm of consistency, I imagine the, the trend is just going up and up. Taking a look as we roll forward through through the game itself. Uh, looking for the opportunities for TSM to find their way back into the game. EG being the aggressors here yet again. But the intelligent response out of TSM with four members collapsing means they pick up two for zero and strike back in. That was about 14 minutes into the game crumb. So again, we're looking at that middle game. We're looking at as soon as players are, are, are enticed out of their lane, got an item in their inventories, and boom, TSM finds a moment to strike. Yeah, they found the moment when they had a big advantage there because I'm looking at the minimap in that fight and I'm wondering, how did TSM have such a big advantage here? And Deathly's all the way in the base. EG's fighting a 4v5. <laughs> so some more areas for Evil Geniuses to clear up as well because they were b being very aggressive, but they have to keep in mind that a champion like Kai'Sa has this advantage over other ADs as her ability to just join a fight before other marksmen is just unlike anybody else. No other AD has such an incredible reposition movement. Even though it didn't play into it so much, though, something that EG really needs to keep in mind for the future. Yeah, for from there, we jump forward 21 minutes into the game. We almost had our second pentakill of the day. Power of Evil, once again, the spotlight player from this game, coming up big on the Azir with a, a quadra kill to boot. Yeah, huge team fight after they had kind of converted that lead uh, from the, the early game. And it's, it's good to see them um, starting to make some more advantages. Uh, <laughs> the... <laughs> 
I don't remember what I was. I'll be honest. My I don't mind remember went what you like, were saying either. Man. My <laughs> mind went to be like, don't let him walk on the keyboard. That's all. My, yeah. That's where my mind went. The LCS. The Where's your cat, Lauren? Cat Do you have series. yours nearby, uh, too? She was actually clawing at me about s seven seconds ago, so she was also bothering me. But I do want to talk about Huni's Nar and that we have given it a lot of criticism in the past, and I'm so happy that he could bring out the Nar, and it's not just like, well, there goes Huni feeding again, because this time, like, he did get dove once, but after that, it was pretty smooth sailing from there, so... He pulled out the NAR and he pulled it out successfully, which I think all TSM fans and analysts around the world have a sigh of relief that he finally did it correctly. Well, the cats on the analyst desk might be impatient, but we do have one more game before we close out the day. It's 100 Thieves looking to tie things up in first place and take down Immortals when we return. Hook, line, and sinker in this assist of the day presented by State Farm. Riding off Closer's jungle pressure, 100 Thieves had Tactical and Core JJ locked against their turret. A great hook and a touch of disrespect later, and 100 Thieves FBI walked away with first blood. That was so good. W into E auto. No reason to Q. You're going to get the skills to land regardless because the E is heat seeking, and Core JJ just gets first blooded. 100 Thieves, they can't keep getting away with it, but they always win bot lane. <laughs>